So our speaker today is Scott Farrell, and Scott is the founder and director of Chivalry Today, and he has more than 30 years of experience in the fields of arms, armor, and medieval military history. He has been involved with independent study programs at the Royal Armories at Leeds and with the Welsh government in charge of preserving castles and other historic monuments. He has a degree in English literature and is an avid reader and student of folklore and Arthurian legend. In addition, Scott studied theatrical performance at San Diego's Old Globe Theater and periodically works as one of the teaching artists with San Diego's Intrepid Shakespeare Company. He has worked with the San Diego City and County Library Systems as part of the annual summer reading program since 2006. Scott is a professional journalist and author, and his articles on medieval history and the ideas of chivalry have appeared in many print and online publications, including Renaissance Magazine, Military History Quarterly, Civil War Times, Chivalry Sports, Tournaments Illuminated, Men Today, and Police Magazine. I know I have a subscription to that one, but no. <laughs> his chapter, maybe the Men Today. Um, his chapter, Sir Aristotle and the Code of Chivalry, is included in the book Martial Arts and Philosophy, and his chapter, The Dark Knight, The Man of Steel and the Philosophy of Chivalry, appears in the 2016 book Batman, Superman, and Philosophy from Open Court Books. You may also recognize his voice as the host of the Chivalry Today podcast and the ringside color commentator from San Diego's acclaimed Tournament of the Phoenix competitive jousting event. Scott has given lectures and demonstrations for a wide variety of groups with an interest in medieval history, armor, castles, knighthood, and the code of chivalry, including the San Diego Shakespeare Society, the New York Times, the San Diego Historical Society, University of California Irvine Faculty Club, San Diego State University, Kiwanis Internationals, the Rotary Club, the Boy Scouts of America, Sisters in Crime Mystery Writers, I like those, and Romance Writers of America. He is joined with his assistant, Laureen Mattis, and she um, is his assistant fighter as well. So we're going to have a wonderful presentation today. Thank you very much. How's everybody doing today? Uh, it's been wonderful to be part of the exhibition so far. Uh, certainly uh, very impressive. Uh, we were here on Friday evening for the members opening uh, and uh, very impressive to see all the stuff on display in the gallery. If, I, has everybody had a chance to see it or yeah, yeah mostly yeah. not? Yeah, okay, good. All right. If not, you're in for a real treat. Um, as I usually say, uh, when I do one of these uh, sort of technical advisory talks, uh, which I often do for like writers groups, uh, that sort of thing, um, please feel free, kind of let me know what I can give you to be helpful because I can talk for hours up here. Real quick, let me start with uh, a, a little bit of terminology um, so that we can get uh, some of our jargon correct. First and foremost, let's take the notion of a suit of armor and take that out of our lexicon, please. Um, if, if, you are, if you are in the know today, you would refer to uh, a full set of armor as simply an armor, an armor. Um, I don't know if that's a necessarily historically valid term, but amongst the armor aficionados, that is kind of the term that says you're in the know about what you're talking about if you refer to it as an armor. Correctly, historically, armor, full armor, like Lorene is wearing, would be referred to as your harness. Being in harness or wearing harness uh, or fighting in harness meant in full armor, in, a, in, in what we would call today a suit of armor. So when, when you are looking at the full tin man get up in there in the exhibition, remember, you're looking at a harness. Okay? Um, many of those harnesses, in fact, are what would correctly be called a garniture. A garniture, uh, a garniture is, in fact, a harness that comes with a variety of exchange pieces uh, meant to allow it uh, to be used for, for 
for a variety of functions. And here we, here we have a few of the exchange pieces on a very famous garniture that's uh, on display in the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Dos Aguas family armor. Um, it was made in Valencia, Spain in the middle of the 16th century. Um, you can see there uh, a few pieces that allow it to be used as both a field harness and a jousting harness, okay? So a field harness means an armor that is meant uh, to be used in war. Uh, a jousting harness is something that is meant to be used for sport. Okay? Uh, so, for example, the uh, up in the upper right, no, yes, right corner, yes, not not heraldic right. Uh, up in the upper right corner, uh, you see the buff, uh, the piece that uh, would bolt on to fit over the chin and neck for jousting. Um, when, when you are jousting, you don't really need to move your head around, and in fact, your, your main concern is that if you get hit in the head with the lance of the opposing knight, you don't want your neck broken. Uh, and so that buff uh, sort of provides a solid cover to the, to the neck and chin. Um, it, below that is the, uh, uh, below that is the uh, uh, counter that covers the elbow. Again, for a joust, you don't really need uh, arm mobility, and so a solid elbow that locks your arm into this position uh, for riding uh, in the joust, no problem. Uh, it protects your arm very well. Down the bottom is the, uh, are the uh, three-quarter greaves, uh, the leg protection that make this a field harness instead of a jousting harness. Uh, brings up something that a lot of people kind of get a little backwards. You might think that for going to war, you want the most armor possible, and that for jousting, for sporting, well, we could lighten things up a little bit for just a game. In fact, kind of the opposite is true. In war, generally you want lighter, actually, Lorraine, uh, come and, uh, for war, grab my uh, spoilers there. For war, uh, with uh, a harness, you might have lighter shoulder armor, like these spoilers that Lorene uh, is showing, that sort of cover the, sh the tops of the shoulders, but don't really fully encompass the arms. Uh, but whereas for a tournament, you might use full pauldrons like this to fully encase the shoulders, limits mobility, but gives you much better protection. Um, this is not really something that would be used uh, necessarily in, in war, because if, if you're going to battle, you need to be able to move around. Now, that, that doesn't mean necessarily that, uh, that um, war armor can't be used for a joust, and in fact, it was quite popular in the 15th and 16th centuries to, to do jousting games in, in field harness, uh, meaning to, to use your war armor in sport. Um, but uh, um, the, the, the purpose of the different types of, uh, different pieces of armor, again, a little backwards, generally armor meant for war is probably gonna be a little lighter than armor meant for jousting, okay? Um, and on the other side here, lower left, uh, we have the, uh, we have the te tessellated targe um, for, for the German style of jousting. Uh, a big, uh, essentially a metal shield that bolts over the shoulder uh, that would have been used in the, in the German style of jousting. In the Italian style of jousting, they would have still had a wooden shield held in the, in the arm. Uh, and uh, for the Italian style of jousting, uh, you have the uh, mezzo sopravetto, uh, which, is a, which is a body protection, again, a second layer of body protection that bolts on over the body arm. Okay, so in any case, uh, a little bit of kind of the, <laughs> the uh, amount of, of uh, technical uh, uh, understanding of the pieces that go into making up a garniture. And what makes it a garniture rather than a, just a collection of pieces is that you'll notice that all of the pieces of that armor are, are uniformly decorated and styled uh, so that even when you swap out the various exchange pieces, uh, it's very clear that all of the pieces of that armor go together. They're all decorated in the same style. Uh, that, that being said, let me, um, as we go along here, I thought one of the things that might be interesting is to talk a little bit about different types of historical, uh, of, of armor from different historical periods. Let's talk a little bit about uh, armor from different periods, uh, because frankly, what you are, what we are demonstrating here today, is 
armor that really is the forerunner of the pieces of armor that you're going to see in the exhibition. Generally, everything that's in there is 16th and 17th century and even a little later. Um, what we are demonstrating here is 14th and 15th century armor. So Lorraine is wearing a real classic uh, late 14th century look in, in her armor. Um, it's uh, kind of just the end of what they would consider to be what, what's generally called transitional armor, meaning the transition between mail and plate. Mail being the, the ring armor, the interlocked rings, uh, that in the, uh, in the 11th and 12th century really would have been the, the sole, and thank you, sir, uh, the sole primary form of armor. Um, not that, it was, not that it was light armor, not that it was inferior armor. Uh, mail is really good armor. Uh, and particularly when it's, uh, when, it's at, well, when it's combined with some sort of padded garment underneath, um, it makes for a very good and effective system of armor. Um, but what they recognized is that by the, by the 13th century, you start seeing uh, some reinforcing pieces put over generally over the bony bits, the head, the elbows and knees, the shins, the, the places that kind of hang out behind the from behind the shield, um, and eventually those reinforced bits uh, get bigger and bigger, covering the forearms and, and the thighs, um, until by the end of the 14th century, uh, the pieces of plate are starting to replace a lot of the mail, and the mail is just being used to fill in the gaps. So. Um, as I said, Lorene's armor is based on uh, is, is pretty much of an exact uh, replica of an armor that is in Schloss-Scherberg uh, Castle in northern Italy, a place in Italy where they speak Italian with a German accent. Um, and, uh, um, and, it, and, and you'll notice also uh, something that we can uh, discuss a little bit. Uh, also, it gives just a, a really classic late 14th century silhouette to the wearer, that sort of pigeon-breasted look long extended waist with the belt kind of giving an, an accentuation of that long line of the hips. Um, we see it in civilian clothing of the time, uh, and it certainly is mirrored in the, in the style of armor that was used, and reminds us that armor is fashion as well as function. Okay, the ar armor, armor generally kind of matched the civilian fashions of the time, and often civilian fashions were based on uh, military, uh, military fashions as well. Right? I mean, think about today the number of people you see walking around with pieces of clothing made out of camo. Um, right? That's, uh, again, sort of our modern version of matching our civilian clothing with the military equipment. Okay? Um, so uh, my thought with this uh, as we go along is, uh, actually, how much do you, of this do you want to drop to be able to get me into mine? Um, I'm fine. Okay. Uh, so, so, with, uh, with an understanding of Lorene in her, again, late 14th century armor, probably from about 1380 to 1390. Um, as we go along, um, we're going we're gonna to get me into my mid-15th century harness, as much as we can, at least. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, and you can kind of see, uh, my goal is with this, you can kind of see how all the pieces work together, uh, how the transition from mostly plate and some mail to almost all plate, how the different, uh, how the different uh, function of the armor uh, works as, as we put it on. Uh, before we do that, let me hit again, based on a couple of, oh, that, that's, whatever, we'll make it work. Based on a couple of questions I heard in the exhibition uh, this weekend, uh, a, a few things, not necessarily armor related, but more historically related that I wanted to hit on. Specifically, uh, I heard somebody somebody saying this weekend as they were looking at one of the armors, oh, that, that was probably made for a 12-year-old boy because uh, in the Middle Ages, nobody lived past 30, and so 12 years old, that was, that was sort of middle-aged. Um, uh, a common misconception that um, we, we often hear that like the average lifespan was 30, and we think that people were dropping dead at age 30. Um, the fact of the matter is that... Um, that, uh, that, yes, it's true, the average, average age of death was about 30, uh, historically. Frankly, that was, that was true up until uh, the, the middle of the 19th century. Um, but, uh, but we have to understand what that average uh, means, because, of course, uh, that's affected greatly by infant mortality. And uh, it, 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 a lot of kids, about one in five, died before the age of five. 
Um, a, a really a different, uh, a different way of thinking of that is life expectancy at age 15 was about 60 years old. If you made it to 15, not uncommon at all to make it to 60. Um, so yes, uh, there was a lot more, there's a lot more early death for kids in the Middle Ages, uh, but it did not mean that, did not, did not mean that when you were 30 years old, you were used up and, and ancient. Okay. Um, so uh, another, another misconception that we often hear, uh, and, and again, I heard uh, a lot of people saying, oh gosh, that armor is so small because they were tiny because of their horrible diets back in, back historically. Um, Wow, a real misconception. Um, the average height of a male in England today is five foot eight inches tall, about, about an inch shorter than, uh, than the average American, although even, in fact, I think in the last decade that has changed to be almost the same as America. Uh, anybody want to take a guess what the average medieval height was? Five foot seven, five foot seven. Uh, one inch shorter than today. Okay, so yes, there were, and, and women uh, were a little, a little shorter overall, um, uh, generally because, uh, you know, poor, uh, poor nutrition, and it, it's, uh, particularly it's a little harder for women with various issues with childbirth and whatever, um, but generally the same was true. Women were slightly shorter in the Middle Ages than today. Um, the average height in 1810, five foot four, okay? So the fact of the matter is, for most people in the Middle Ages, particularly for people living in rural settings, they ate pretty well by today's standard. Lots of vegetables, uh, um, a little bit of meat and protein. They got plenty of exercise, uh, lots of fresh air. It was a fairly healthy lifestyle. It wasn't until the 17th and 18th centuries as people started migrating into the cities and working in factories uh, and eating horrible diets that the average size went down. That misconception comes from a, uh, sort of looking back from a modern perspective and realizing that 100, 150 years ago, people were really short and just assuming that was a straight curve going back into history. Okay? But in fact, it's a dip that, uh, that overall size took uh, over, over the last century or so. Um, and in fact, in the Middle Ages, people were not really significantly smaller than they were today. Uh, one more thing, oh, real quick, just uh, again, a question because it, it came, came up. Uh, how, much, how much did all of this armor cost? Um, cost, uh, cost of anything historically is a little challenging to deal with because what we're trying to do is recognize what the value of something is uh, relative to sort of overall income uh, and what the what currency was worth and what the what the economy was like. Uh, a little hard to a little hard to put a hard and fast figure on uh, because if we just look at what the price tag is, it doesn't necessarily tell us uh, tell us what that uh, what that means. But let's take a look at uh, the jousting armor uh, commissioned by Henry VIII. Uh, in 1540, right? Um, contemporary, contemporaneous with at least a few of the harnesses that you'll see in the exhibition, certainly of an equivalent style, which is to say a princely level of armor that is highly decorated and custom fit. Uh, at the time, it cost 300 pounds. At the same time, an average uh, family income, a comfortable family income, was 10 pounds per year. You do the math on that, the equivalent, uh, you, do the, you do the math on that, um, if we say today, we might think of a comfortable family income at about 100,000 a year, that would put the value of that armor at about $3 million. Okay. Um, and, uh, and every time I give a talk on armor and armor value, I always double check this because it just sounds insane. Uh, but Yes, the level of value, depending on the number of experts that I've, I've talked to, calculated this for a full, again, full nightly harness, not just bits and pieces, a full nightly harness, generally the estimate is probably somewhere between half a million and three and a half million dollars, okay? So if someone was saying earlier, it's like an Italian sports car, I think it's a little bit more like a private helicopter. 
Um, so uh, that, that gives you a sense of when you're walking around the exhibition. That gives you a sense of who it was that owned those harnesses. Um, th these guys were the one percenters of their, of their society. Okay? Uh, all right. That's all I need to say about that. Okay. Um, hey, let's put on a little armor here, uh, and I'm going to drop the microphone to do it. Um, we're going to start, uh, I'm going to start with, um, with the voiders, okay? So the voiders are the, uh, unlike Lorene, who is still wearing a male haubergeon underneath her, underneath her cuirass, um, that male shirt that, that covers all the bits uh, that, that her plate does not cover. Um, with, my, with my harness, I don't need mail under there. Um, I just need some little, some little scraps of mail to cover the gaps that the plate armor doesn't, uh, doesn't cover. And, and that coverage is provided by what they call the voiders, mail that covers the voids in the armor. Okay? Um, some voiders could have been uh, a pair of sleeves like this, although you certainly see a lot of illustrations of male, uh, sort of male shoulder pieces being stitched to leather panels, so almost like a sort of a small leather vest with little male sleeves, or sometimes the male literally just stitched onto the armpits of the doublet, all of those perfectly uh, legitimate ways of providing, uh, providing male voiders. Uh, well, well, and as we put this on, my highly trained and, and, uh, and, and experienced uh, valet here is going to, once I get my, those voiders on, she's going to have to fish out the arming points, uh, the ties that, all, that are tied to the foundation garment, the doublet, so that they can get, be fed out through the male voiders and ready to tie on to the various pieces of armor. Okay? Well, she's doing that, uh, and do I have any questions that I can address? Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah, great. What, what's the weight? Um, when I'm in full harness, uh, I'm wearing probably uh, up <coughs> about 60 pounds of armor. Um, Lorene may be a little lighter in hers, um, uh, but, but not by much. Probably 50 to 60 pounds for, uh, is, is a good average weight uh, for a, a full harness. Um, that may sound like a lot. Uh, but it's not like carrying around a 60-pound dumbbell. Okay? Uh, armor is tailor-made for the wearer. Uh, um, it distributes that weight over your body very nicely. Believe me, by the end of the day out of wearing armor, I know I've been carrying around 60 pounds all day. Um, but it moves with you nicely. It sits comfortably on your body. Armor that's well-made distributes the weight between your shoulders and your hips, uh, your ar arms and legs a little bit. Um, and uh, I mean, it is interesting to, uh, to recognize also that um, I've got a couple of my assistants who were in the military. Uh, one, one, of, one of them was a Marine sniper. And he says his field kit when he was out in the field, 60 pounds. So the bottom line is that's about what the human body can carry and continue to do the job of a warrior. That, that hasn't changed over the years. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, yes. Our, 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 another myth that a lot of people have is that armor was so heavy or cumbersome that if you fell to the ground, you couldn't get back up. Wow, a soldier that falls down and can't get back up is not much of a soldier. Um, yeah, uh, and, and period documents talk about um, knights uh, being able to vault into the saddle without touching the stirrups, uh, being able to turn somersaults, being able to climb up the underside of a ladder. Uh, so yeah, a, 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 lot, a lot of maneuverability. Yeah. Did they, uh, a question is, did they make the armor so that you could gain or lose weight? <laughs> um, my armor, no. Um, as as Jonathan was sort of showing this weekend, there certainly are some little tricks that you could that you could do in what they would have called uh, munitions grade armor, which is kind of armor that's uh, armor that is mass produced for cannon fodder and foot soldiers, um, made with slots and straps that can be readjusted and fit to sort of a small, medium, large size. It's not super comfortable, but it does the job. Uh, armor like mine that is, uh, that, that literally is, you know, tailor-made to my body, whoo, you better not gain too much weight. I mean, yes, there, there's a few, there's a few adjustment holes in these straps, but you gain more than about an inch, 
you're sending a, you're sending a, a, a check to the armorer for another piece of armor. Um, I had a question. Obviously, these are later model, beautiful pieces, as are the pieces in the exhibition. Where um, does armor come from originally? Um, what region and what period did armor start getting utilized? Yeah, our, there were certainly, by the, by the end of the 14th century, there were some recognized armor-making centers, um, generally, generally, in northern Italy and southern Germany. Um, and pla places where you had uh, both um, experienced, uh, you know, a lineage of expertise of expert armor makers, are also relatively uh, relatively easy access to the raw materials. You look at the places that they were making armor, like Milan, Innsbruck, uh, Dresden, all around the Alps, all where they where they were mining where they were mining the ore out of the out of the mountains and being able to being able to craft the armor uh, relatively close by. And what about follow? What about the Middle East? I'm Iranian. Yeah. We have our own version of all of this there. So is that are those traditions talking, or is it the same period? Um, it's uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, Middle Eastern uh, Middle Eastern armor uh, was sort of an it had an equivalent equivalency in the same period. Um, but, but what you see a lot in uh, the, the, the primary difference between like Middle Eastern armor and European armor is that this, this is generally made for a European climate. Um, a lot of Middle Eastern armor, they, they didn't graduate away from mail so much because frankly mail with a couple layers of silk under it, still relatively cool, breathes pretty well. Um, it, it's, a, it's a lighter style of armor, but you don't overheat, right? Um, so a lot of, uh, during the Crusades, you see a lot of the Crusaders from Europe ditching their heavy European armor as they get down into the Mediterranean climate. Yeah. Um, what what you done? One, one more second, then I'll get back to you. So what you'll you steal my mic? What you will notice is um, that even my armor, even my mid 15th century armor. Uh, the primary difference that you're going to see uh, as you go into the exhibition is um, this is relatively plain. Uh, it is what they call in the white, uh, which was uh, which means that nice polished, shiny look. Um, it didn't take long for craftsmen to realize that uh, hey, all of these nice flat uh, metal surfaces provide a great canvas for beautiful artwork, for artwork like etching and engraving for gold inlay, for repose, or the, the sort of shaping to make, uh, to make figures on the surface of the armor. Um, so by the 16th century, as you walk through the exhibition, you'll see much more highly decorated surfaces of the armor, um, where, whereas, again, by the middle of the 15th century, still relatively plain, uh, relatively plain design on the armor. Did the designs, or were there designs on certain armors that identified a rank and therefore maybe a better target? Uh, yes. Well, so yes. Um, I mean, you can even see, like in, in uh, Henry VIII's armor, um, the, the when I say like a princely type of armor, uh, armor that is gold inlaid, often. It, we, we do see some armors that you know literally say, this is the Duke of Burgundy, that sort of thing. Um, the, the purpose of that, you know, to make someone a target, uh, you know, I hear a lot of people say like, oh, well, but that, that meant that, that they were, uh, that they expected to be ransomed, that that was a way of saving themselves in battle. Uh, you read historical documents and that doesn't seem to be the way that they considered. Um, taking a risk in battle and in tournament uh, was, uh, was considered to be a very uh, chivalric, very noble thing to do um, to to craft an armor that would that would give you the advantage of being ransomed. That may be the, that may truly have been the result, but that was that didn't really enter into their mentality when they when they were putting together an armor like that. Uh, that was just a way of demonstrating. It, it is what we would call today shock and awe. 
When you, when you see that coming at you in the battlefield, uh, you are literally almost seeing a living god, a living saint, a superhero coming at you in battle. Um, and that really was the purpose of all of that ornamentation and ostentation on the armor uh, uh, was, uh, was to sort of present that image on the battlefield. There's a reason that you know, in many of the Renaissance paintings, you see the warrior saints, Michael, George, James, dressed in full you know, contemporary armor of the time. Um, the, to a, that, that purpose of that was, or, or sort of the, the result of that, if you will, was sort of allowing the knights in their armor to be almost that semi-divine continuation of, of archangels and warrior saints and knights on the battlefield. Question. So, um, how do you keep it um, in good condition? Do you have to use W W T forty. I'm gonna let Lorraine answer that one. And, and, on, and it has a second part. Yeah. Like if it rains, <laughs> does it get rusty or? Yes. It, okay. The white, it loves to rust. Um, this year it's been particularly humid. We have spent a lot of time cleaning it. Every time we take out this armor and use it, every time we touch it, we wipe it down. We use a lanolin base kind of oil. Um, but it absolutely has to be wiped down, otherwise you get little surprises, you know, popping up everywhere. Uh, and it's it can be very difficult to remove if you let the rust get far enough along. WD-40 is certainly a good answer, although it's a fairly light oil and it, it tends to dry off pretty quickly. Um, like Lorraine said, we use lanolin oil. Uh, it's a little heavier oil. Um, I like it because uh, it also it's it's a type of oil that they would have used. Uh, it, has, it sort of has that. That historically authentic smell to it, uh, kind of like a wet sheep. Uh, they, they would have used rendered animal fat, perhaps, or if you're really uh, well off, they might have used um, uh, vegetable oil, olive, olive oil. <laughs> um, uh, the, actually, since that was one of the things I was going to address, give me just a moment here, and I will. About armor, <laughs> um, so uh, armor, armor. Uh, like said, armor in the white, meaning knight in shining armor, highly polished, uh, was a fairly rare thing in, in medieval armor. It's hard to maintain, and if you are wearing armor in the white, it means that you have a team of flunkies whose job it is to make sure that your armor stays nice and polished. It is quite a statement. Um, a lot of the armor you'll see in there is, or at least was, finished, given some sort of chemical finishing. Chem chemical blackening or chemical bluing gives it just a deep, rich, uh, dark finish to it, uh, much like the barrel of a, of a, of a gun, uh, that sort of, uh, that sort of uh, you know, almost chromium blue kind of look. Uh, it sets off all of the gold inlay very beautifully. Uh, but not everybody could afford that level of, uh, of finish. If you were just a flunky foot soldier, your armor might have been painted. Uh, they certainly had plenty of painted armor of, at the time. Uh, you'll notice this, uh, this style of helmet, called the Salette, uh, has kind of a, a funky looking star paint job on it. And it's not a very, it's not a very nicely shaped piece of armor. That, that, arm, that helmet is not very head shaped. Uh, that, that is the bare minimum that the armorer needed to do in order to make a helmet that would sit on someone's head uh, and then give it a little bit of a, of a paint job to keep it from rusting. Uh, there are other armors. There are other armors uh, that, sh that still have their existing uh, paint on them. Over on the right side, you see sort of a monster face painted on that cellette uh, that again, uh, if you compare it to some of the, the beautifully shaped armors in the exhibition, that thing is a bucket. Uh, and so, um, uh, so somebody, somebody painted kind of an orc face on the front of that. Uh, the one on the right here looks like it has a beautiful gold or brass cross on it. Yeah, that's painted on. Um, the, 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 the painter did the job of giving that a little bit of detail so that it looks like there's some shading to it, uh, as if as if that is a piece of metal sitting on the front of the helmet, but it's just a paint job. Um, here you can see one more salad that has a little bit of its 
original paint job that had some heraldry or something. Uh, you can see how it's been worn off over the ages. Um, but uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of armor that originally was painted uh, back in the 19th century during the Gothic Revival, uh, when there's a, lot of Im there's a lot of interest in pulling all this old armor out of castle attics and warehouses and whatever and putting it on display in museums, a lot of museum curators uh, got out their brushes and scouring pads and polished off all that nasty old paint uh, to get the armor shiny like armor is supposed to be. Um, and in fact, uh, today, go back a couple here, uh, today that monster, that monster faced salette, uh, that's one of the most, uh, for, for its time, as I said, was just a lousy, cheap piece of munitions grade armor. Today that is one of the most valuable uh, pieces in the Wallace collection because it retains its original paint job. Um, so, uh, so uh, the, what, what was once cheap, uh, cheap and, and gaudy armor uh, has now become uh, highly, highly, highly treasured and valued because of that original paint job. Uh, yes, they, they can, certainly uh, you can see out of the sights of, of a of a of a visor. Uh, grab the grab it, Sally. Uh, you can see out of the sights. Uh, no, other one. My, my English. Um, you can see what you need to see, which is to say, uh, generally you can see forward. Um, it, it does kind of cut down your peripheral vision a little bit, and and you can't necessarily see the feet of the person that's standing in front of you. Um, but often you'll see, pump the visor on that, often you'll see in the middle of battle, uh, again, kind of getting back to the, uh, kind of getting back to the notion of things are a little backwards from what we might think. Um, often in a tournament, in a game, you would have the visor down, but in the middle of battle, we see a lot of images of knights with their visors up. Um, way more important to see and breathe in the middle of a battle. Now, the nice thing about a movable visor like that is that in, if, if, if you are commanding your troops, you can pop open your visor, you can see what's going on around you, you can yell to your commanders. If you get into trouble, it's a quick, quick little job to pop the visor down. Suddenly, you're pretty well protected, you can fight, and once you're done uh, fighting, if, if you need to get a drink of water or issue commands, pop the visor back up. Yeah. Um, it, it, and that being said, once we get done here, uh, anybody who would like to see exactly what you can see from uh, these helms, welcome to come up and uh, stick one on your head and see what the visibility is like from inside there. As far as the armies, did the government provide, say something, expect that the government or someone provide this outfit for all of those people to wear? Or how does that work? So, a little bit of... <coughs> There's a, a, a little bit of a disconnect there because here's the deal. By the time you get to the armor that you see in the exhibition, yeah, a lot. Now we're getting into the, to, to the time of nation states, in the early modern period, and yeah, the government or what, what at least started to look like the government um, would have been providing uh, equipment for their guards and their and their militias. In the Middle Ages, no, that would uh, that would have that was part of kind of the feudal expectations of a lord or a knight was when they, when, when they conscripted knights and men-at-arms from their lands, part of the deal there was, I will equip you for the amount of time that you come and serve me, I will equip you uh, with, with what you need to do your job. Um, generally, that was a, a period of 40 days a year. Um, and so uh, for knights that came and served in camp on campaign, um, presumably they got the equipment uh, that was necessary. There certainly is plenty of records of knights showing up in sort of lousy armor and, wait a minute, that's not the armor I provided for you. Oh, no, that's in the cleaners today, sir. Um, so, uh, um, uh, so, yeah, it was, it was sort of the expectation that you would be generally provided with the armor, arms and armor that you would need. And, that, and, and we see a lot of uh, like castle inventories that talk about how much armor is, is in the castle to be used. So many male shirts in good condition. So many male shirts in fair condition. So many male shirts unusable. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so probably the better knights and the commanders of the army got the best equipment. 
the lousy little foot shoulders that showed up with their pitchfork, got a hubcap and a, and a male and a rusty male shirt to go into battle with on that kind of thing. Yeah. Another question? Yep. My question is, uh, when they're preparing for battle, you said that they had a team to keep it all shiny. Who helps them vest? Who helps them put the uh, stuff on? And how long does that usually take? And do they help each other, or do they have teams for that? Uh, this looks like a fairly cooperative effort here um, uh, as we're doing this. If, if, if I was to do this in true medieval style, I stand here, uh, and my body squires will uh, dress me in armor and, and make me prepare to go to battle or tournament. Um, it, a good example, if you will, uh, any Shakespeare fans, um, in, in the play Henry V, they talk about, uh, before the Battle of Agincourt, uh, the, the French army throughout the night uh, being accomplished in their armor. You can hear the armor makers closing up rivets, uh, preparing the knights for battle, um, and, and uh, literally starting to prepare for battle before dawn. Uh, and, and that would have been the process of several hours of arming, getting the horses and, and, and equipment ready, um, getting the soldiers in position. Am I screwed up here? Um, get, getting the soldiers in position and ready to, to fight in their units. Um, and and uh, th there would have been a, a large team, certainly for someone who's wearing armor like this, that is likely to be uh, a powerful magnate, a baron or earl or duke. Uh, you would have a large team to uh, carry all of your equipment, uh, keep you well prepared uh, for battle. If you were just a simple household knight, you might have a squire or two and perhaps a couple of pack horses. Uh, that would have been your, your whole kit. Um, uh, and and uh, you would have had a relatively, uh, relatively simple job of getting ready for battle. Where do you buy your modern day armor? <laughs> Where do you go shopping? Uh, our armor is primarily made by um, replica armor makers uh, in, in Eastern Europe. There's some, some great armor that is being made in Russia and Ukraine uh, today to outfit some of the living history groups uh, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, Western martial arts uh, practitioners over there. Um, so, um, yeah, all, all, all of mine, all of mine was made in a few bits and pieces, mostly by a Russian armor named Peter Polyak, um, and, and uh, some bits of, of Lorraine's again from from different Ukrainian armors. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's where that's where we get our stuff from today. I have a question. Will you be covering equestrian in the armor? Uh, we can talk a little bit about you know, there. Um, armor for the horse. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, certainly, uh, particularly for a for a full again as part of a full knightly harness. You would have had some pieces of armor for your horse. Uh, but you can see even from that one uh, in the Wallace collection, the horse was not fully armored uh, from from front to back. Generally, the the one piece of armor that you see uh, pretty much universally on a horse was a chamfron. The, the piece that covers their face. Um, the, that, that's the piece that you need for your horse to be well protected as you are moving forward into battle. Once a horse's head gets past whatever is in danger, the horse itself becomes a weapon. Uh, and, and it do, does not necessarily need to be armored. The horse is not going to stand there passively and let people attack it. And hopefully the knight on the horse's back is not going to ignore uh, anybody that's threatening the horse. There are other pieces. Uh, there are other pieces that, the, that protect the, the, the um, shoulders and, and the back of the horse. Uh, but the, the problem is that that adds a lot of weight to, to a horse. Um, and um, there's always that, that trade-off of not your, your horse, the big advantage of it being fast and mobile. You don't really want to cut down on that any more than is necessary. Right. Uh, well, I had one uh, visitor last weekend that asked about uh, the bit and the type of bit that would have been used. And I had no clue. But what would be a good source to find out more about the equestrian gear? Uh, That's what I'm interested <laughs> okay. in, too. Um, th there, there is a trying to think where it was. There was a bit that I saw, I don't remember if it was in one of the paintings in there or if there was an actual bit in there. 
But it's interesting, the, 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 and I don't do any horse riding myself, but the, the bits that they used by our standard are really harsh. Um, it, 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 it's a big long bit that provides a, a sort of a lever against the horse's mouth that for us today we would think is downright cruel. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that a, a big stallion, not too many brain cells, um, in the middle of battle, you've got to have that harsh equipment in order to get its attention. Uh, otherwise, it will just sort of go crazy uh, and, and not listen to its right. Yeah. Um, I would check, potentially, um, check at the, like the website of the Royal Armories at Leeds. They do a lot of, uh, a lot of demonstrations of uh, horseback uh, of mounted work, they might have some information for you about uh, about saddles and pack. And then, what is the mesh the Male, male. The, so the 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 pointers here are made of male, um, and uh, and so actually something I, I wanted to point out again once we take a break here. Feel free to come up and take a look at our mail. Um, the one thing I, I find kind of interesting, whatever, is uh, you'll notice, look, look at the size of the rings. Uh, these rings are about eight or nine millimeter in interior diameter, and they are huge compared to the male that you will see on some of the pieces in the exhibition. It's more like five or six millimeter. Uh, again, remember, every one of these rings has to be made, shaped, closed by hand. Lorene's shirt, anybody want to take a guess at how many rings are in this shirt? About 20,000 rings in that shirt. Uh, and, and, and again, this is in a day when you can buy wire relatively easily. Nobody's pounding this out by hand. Uh, so uh, it, takes, it, takes a, it, it does not take a lot of technical expertise to make mail. It takes a lot of time. Uh, so uh, take a look at the, like, like I say, the, the size of some of the rings. Uh, compare ours to the ones in the exhibition. Uh, and you'll be astonished when you think about the amount of effort and time required to make that stuff. Well, how is the male spelled? As with all pre-modern spelling, I can give you a handful of ways that you could find it in documentation. But generally, just, just like postage, M-A-I-L, uh, sometimes you see it's M-A-I-L-L-E. Uh, but uh, remember, day before, this is day before standardized spelling. It, it was spelled however who, whoever was writing it thought it sounded. <laughs> yeah. What was the role of the church in sponsoring knights? Uh, wow, that's, that's a college course. That <laughs> uh, I'll give you uh, two quick uh, uh, kind of elements of that answer. Uh, one of the goals of every knight through the Middle Ages was to go on crusade. That was considered to be sort of the most worthy type of pilgrimage that you could make to the Holy Land. Okay? So the church uh, did, had all sorts of what we would consider like tax breaks uh, and incentives for knights to go on campaign to the, to the Holy Land to go on crusade. That was a good thing. Uh, one of the things that the, the church did not like was knights uh, taking part in tournaments and games. They saw that as an exhibition in, in vanity and greed, and, and literally, uh, church documents call that the seven deadly sins rolled up into one. Uh, so they were really against tournaments, uh, and uh, in, in much of the earlier part of the Middle Ages, we see the church issuing uh, edict after edict after edict, banning tournaments. And the fact that they had to do it about every five years tells you just how effective it was. <laughs> because I think it is important. One of, the, one of the things that we talk about a lot when we do, uh, when we work with schools and young folks, um, it can seem like, oh, you know, this whole knights in armor thing, oh, it's a boys club. And I, can, I see, like, the young ladies in the audience start to zone out. Oh, who cares? Um, but the fact of the matter is that... Um, that uh, women had a big part to play in the culture of chivalry and the ideals uh, that went along with it. Um, and there are certainly um, plenty, of, uh, plenty of documents uh, of women in armor uh, throughout the Middle Ages. Obviously, everybody probably is fairly aware of Joan of Arc, um, warrior, uh, a, a young female warrior, uh, peasant who 
was spoken to by God, whatever you want to consider that that meant, uh, and led the French armies to victory in the, in the Hundred Years' War. Um, there's, there's an instance of, uh, of um, Queen Elizabeth I uh, addressing her troops at Tilbury in 1588 before they went off to fight the Spanish Armada wearing armor. Uh, and in fact, that image of uh, Queen Elizabeth in what they would have called heroic armor or armor al anteca, meaning antique style of armor, meant to mimic sort of the classical Roman and Greek look of armor, uh, is very similar to a harness that is uh, on display in the, in the exhibition. Um, she's wearing a cuirass or a torso covering that's made to look like it's made of, of a series of scales, scale armor. Um, again, very much like that one in there. Um, and she did that to, uh, to emphasize, um, you know, sort of her martial spirit to make herself part of sort of the culture of knights and chivalry. One other one that I usually like to point to is a, a Jean, Countess of Montfort, who uh, led troops in, in battle in the Hundred Years' War, um, led 300 knights into, into battle uh, during a time when her castle was, was sieged and her young son was, was too young to lead troops himself. Nobody batted an eye at her. Uh, nobody thought uh, that she needed to be burned at the stake or, or anything. In fact, they called her Joan the Fierce uh, because, I'm uh, sorry, sorry, Joan the Fiery because, uh, of, because of her sp spirit in battle and her ability to lead troops. Um, and you'll notice even Lorene in armor here, um, although <laughs> for what it's worth, um, that armor is mine. So Lorene potentially kind of dressed in drag there. Uh, but. Uh, <laughs> But um, there, there is no real difference between armor meant to fit a man and armor meant to fit a woman. Uh, there, there are certainly chronicles from the, from the period, from the Middle Ages, um, uh, of uh, women's bodies being found among the dead uh, after a battle, dressed in armor. Um, the chronicler's surprised to see, oh, these women were out on the battlefield fighting, and nobody knew, right? They, they were not there in their battle bikinis or anything. Um, I, when I, so I was going to let uh, Lorene address just a little bit of what the experience of fighting in armor as a woman is, as much as you want to, much you want to deal with that. I'll make it pretty quick because we do have to wrap up. Um, you know, there was a quote from a woman who is a practitioner of HEMA, Historical European Martial Arts. Um, who does this, um, Jess Finley, and she called armor the great equalizer. Um, and it's very true to a certain extent. Um, you know, there's always going to be someone bigger than you, someone stronger than you as a man, and if strength was all it took to win a fight, you really you wouldn't need armor. Um, so it's really more of an emphasis on the technique while you're wearing that harness and what you do with that harness so much more than it is in regards to just being able to arm wrestle someone. Um, all I have to say on it right now. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. And uh, <laughs> just, just, again, just to emphasize um, that uh, also women had a huge part in the culture of chivalry. Um, uh, the women's opinion of what knights were doing in jousting tournaments uh, when they were away on campaign, um, in, when they were working in their castles, women's opinion and uh, carried a, a huge amount of, uh, of uh, influence and authority. Um, so while women did not necessarily have a lot of the legal authority uh, that we would expect in sort of a culture of equal rights today, uh, the notion of chivalry did give women a, a great deal of uh, prestige and influence in their culture that they had not had before. Um, okay, good, I'll leave it at that. Uh, realize this is a college course, but I really would like to hear what is chivalry, what are the tenets of chivalry. Um, I've read that uh, in some instances the knights were celibate, living more like priests, etc. Um, I'll leave it to you. Sure, okay, yeah. Uh, as quickly as I can make that college course. Um, the notion of chivalry changed a great deal. Remember, with the Middle Ages, we were talking about a period of almost a thousand years. Uh, the notion of chivalry changed from just sort of a basic warrior's code into a, into a sort of a, a notion of, of courtesy and, uh, and, and high ideals um, to something that was you know, also almost seen as kind of decadent by the end of the Middle Ages. Um, so it probably would have depended a lot on 
which knight you talked to and what period they lived in as to what the definition of chivalry really was. William Marshall in the 12th century would have had a very different ideal of chivalry than uh, Geoffrey de Charnay in the 14th century, who might have had a very different idea of chivalry than Miguel de Cervantes did when he was writing Don Quixote. Um, so, uh, but in general, yes, that it's that culmination of strength and gentleness, of, uh, of ferocity and, and humility uh, that kind of make the ideals of chivalry uh, you, uh, noteworthy. Uh, what was the second part of that? The... Oh, what are they like priests? Um, well, there also were different, uh, were different sort of orders of knighthood. And so, yes, there were monastic orders of knighthood, knight, uh, uh, groups of knights whose structure was based on kind of the monastic model uh, that would have, might have had an aspect of celibacy, like the Knights Templar or the Knights Hospitallers, a famous crusading orders of knight. There were secular orders of knighthood, uh, for whom tournamenting and uh, and spectacle was kind of their reason for existence. Oh, they were not celebrated at all. <laughs> so, uh, so yes, uh, th th there were different structures and expectations of of various kinds of knights. And and something that I think is worth coming away from is just remember, you read history books and they kind of give you the impression that knights did blah or knights fought such and such. Knights were human beings, and, and just as everyone in this room would have, if we if we had uh, you know a survey of different interests and expectations, uh, we would all have sort of different uh, ideas on those. There were knights that loved gardening, and there were knights that loved reading, and there were knights that loved to go to battle and, and learn sword fighting, all those kinds of things. Yeah. All right, sorry everyone, we're going to wrap it up at this point, but thank you very much, Scott.